Good morning, everybody. As you uh, are coming into the Zoom session now, you can see the numbers are the participants is rising rapidly. Um, so we'll just wait for numbers to get to where we think they should be. In the meantime, uh, I'm Adam Williams. I head up the immigration team at DMH Stallard. I have with me Bermi Chokar is the senior associate in the team, and uh, we're going to be delivering this business immigration update in relation to new and uh, amended visa routes since uh, that are coming in from April 2022 this year. So um, a bit of backdrop to the session today. It's We've got an hour with some time we're going to try and keep at the end for questions, and you can um, put your questions to us through the Q&A function on the Zoom uh, system there. Um, please use those for questions. If you have technical issues, please don't put them in the Q&A, put them in the chat function. Um, they can be picked up there. Um, and we will um, spend about half of the, the, the core presentation of the session looking at global business mobility as a new overarching banner for a number of different routes involving entities being uh, connected between the UK and overseas. And then we'll look at some of the new routes that aren't linked to that business banner necessarily, but are often ones that individuals can use for um, visas to come to the UK without the need for sponsorship, for example, around some of the things around uh, student visas and graduate visas. The focus is all going to be uh, on uh, uh, the uh, recruitment of individuals and how that's going to work um, and how these new changes might actually change the way in which you recruit, might give you uh, more uh, more um, options and things that you can do um, and open up different ways to fill. Obviously, what is for a lot of people on this Zoom, I'm sure, um, the issue of filling skilled roles or shortage roles with suitable workers where we have that uh, shortage at the moment. So uh, we're going to start on uh, global business mobility. And what I've done in the, in the first slide we're going to look at is give an overview of the old routes. And broadly, we're talking about the routes that have been in place and that could be applied for up until April of this year, early April this year. Um, and uh, we're going to look at how they've translated into new routes. So um, looking at the old routes, we've got several different examples down the left hand side. There's representative of an overseas business. And that has become under the Global Business Mobility Banner UK Expansion Worker. There's intra-company transfer in the sense of the more highly skilled, highly paid individuals employed by a commonly owned or controlled entity over, uh, overseas, outside the UK, moving to the UK um, with a graduate skill level role. That's now called Senior or Specialist Worker under the new Global Business Mobility Banner. Um, the... Um, intra-company transfer graduate trainee route uh, and the that's become graduate trainee worker. The T5 international agreement route, which wasn't sitting specifically under a sponsored work route before, uh, now moves into this broader category of global business mobility uh, as the uh, service suppliers worker route. And secondments, where they're actually in the, in the position up to April this year, there were no formal dedicated routes for secondments transferring internationally into the UK. And now we have a new route called secondment worker. So we don't have a lot of time today, but we're going to go through each of those, try to give you a good solid sense of what they are and what they involve. And really with the aim of you, you being able to piece this together and work out whether these are things that should be added to the mix of your recruitment plans for, for um, visa sponsorship, for example, if you're already a skilled worker sponsor, or actually if you're not a sponsor yet, maybe these some of these things that come out today uh, will spur you on to become a sponsor uh, and, and use some of these routes to bring in um, the best possible candidate for roles rather than the best that it is available and that already has a right to work in the in the UK. So looking at UK expansion worker then, the first on the list. Now this is relevant for businesses who don't have an established presence yet in the UK. Uh, it's important that employers know about it. Uh, and that you as, as senior people in HR and recruitment know about it, because of course your business structures and where you work may change. Um, but it's particularly important if you've got an HQ overseas. Replaces a former non-points-based system visa called representative of an overseas business. And it's really about 
the, a visa entitling someone to move to the UK in order to act as the senior representative of that business to establish it in the UK. And there's some quite important changes that have come through from April on this. So the old route of, of what we call ROB has closed. Now it's a sponsored route called UK Expansion Worker under Global Business Mobility. And um, you need a sponsor license. And actually, if you don't have someone you've identified who's already in the UK as your senior individual that's going to be in the UK responsible for sponsorship, called the authorising officer, then actually you have to apply for a sponsor license from abroad. So that the entity outside of the UK applies for a provisional license so that that authorising officer can fly into the UK with one of these visas and establish the, the setup and then get a full license and can potentially bring others in. You can have up to five workers use an, a UK expansion worker visa, but that will include the authorising officer if they aren't already in the UK. So this is entirely new in terms of sponsorship. Um, it's something that the Home Office has introduced and I'm sure is working through exactly how it works when you've got entities overseas looking to demonstrate their genuine business and they have a business plan for the UK. Um, but to help, by, we, we've got, put examples in for each of these new categories to give you a sense of, of exactly how it might work. So in this case, we've got, um, and this is actually a real life example, although it's been adjusted because um, obviously we're now in this new form of visa. And when we advised this business, we were using the, the ROV visa that is now since April fallen away. But you might have an Australian headquartered producer of beef with operations in Singapore and China, but it wants to expand into the UK. And it might be selling product into the UK, but it doesn't have an established presence. So it gets premises for operations in the UK, makes arrangements with customers to say, we're going to be based in the UK, this is how we're going to operate, and then applies from Australia for a provisional license from the Home Office to sponsor the move of its head of sales, Far East, to the UK to manage that entity pre-trading and then for one or up to two years if, if the visa is extended, of its operations. And once in the UK, that head of sales will be able to obtain a full A-rated sponsor license and then sponsor up to four colleagues to come over to assist with that establishment and expansion. And in this scenario, we've tracked forward um, because we wanna try and give you a timeline of how these recruitment strategies can work longer term. Uh, and that's important because global business mobility, all these visa routes that I'm talking about in global business mobility are not routes to settlement in the UK. They only give you a right to stay for so long as the visa lasts, but they are potential routes to then switch into a settlement route uh, once you're here, a route that leads to settlement, I should say, like skilled workers. So in this scenario, we've put in that once the business is up and operational, it adds to its sponsor license, the skilled worker route, and that will enable it to sponsor uh, the individuals. In this case, we've said that they've chosen to sponsor three of the colleagues to stay permanently in the UK. They make a new in-country switching application and that will allow them to stay um, and extend for as long as they want to stay in the UK as a skilled worker. But after five years as a skilled worker, potentially then get indefinite leave to remain and they won't need sponsorship anymore. So that gives you a timeline for that. Senior or specialist worker. And I think this is going to be probably as it has been under its old form, tier two intracompany transfer for highly paid and skilled, probably the most common of these intra-company international transfer visas under global business mobility, certainly in the short to medium term. So as I say, it replaces tier two intra-company transfer for highly skilled and paid workers. And the existing um, employee of a commonly owned or controlled entity outside the UK is who is gonna be potentially eligible for this role. So you've got UK employer, you've got foreign employer, they share common ownership or control. And you have a senior individual uh, who's employed and already been employed by the entity outside the UK wants to transfer in. It has to be a graduate skilled role for this visa, which is higher than the skill level requirement for skilled worker visas, which is outside of global business mobility is by far the most common sponsored work visa, which can be, if you've got the right role and pay level, could be used potentially for any form of new hire. For these intra-company transfer, and now called senior specialist worker visas, it's a graduate, not A-level skilled role, and there's a minimum for the visa of £42,400 salary. Or it could be higher than that if the going rate for the particular role that you are, um, uh, you're, being, you're being sponsored you know, or you're sponsoring is higher than, um, than the, uh, uh, the rate that you uh, are going to pay. Can I just remind everybody that the chat function is, is for technical issues, not the question and answers function. Uh, do use the chat function so that someone 
can pick that up and assist you, not the question and answers function. Um, this visa allows you to stay for up to five years or nine if you are particularly highly paid. But again, it's not a route to settlement. And really the main benefit of using this route at present, um, an, an upside compared to using skilled worker would be to, um, to for, for individuals who have issues establishing English language. These categories of, of visa don't require a minimum level of English language uh, ability. And so if you, but skilled worker does. So if, you, if you're going to have difficulty with the individual establishing English language, then um, you'll, um, you, you'll need to be looking at this sort of visa if the pay and skill level can, can be met. So a quick example here then, IT service provider in London and Prague, two different entities, wants to send head of software development for two years to the UK to train and manage a team of developers here. So they're not planning for the person to stay long term. The business, UK branch of the business, gets a senior or specialist worker route license under Global Business Mobility, sponsors the manager for a period of two years. Could be longer, could be shorter, but that's the period they, they think they need the manager to be in the UK. Towards the end of that two years, they actually change their mind and they identify they'd like the manager to stay for another year. So they sponsor him for another year, but they don't just extend the senior or specialist worker visa. They actually have a skilled worker license, so they switch with sponsorship, he switches in to a skilled worker route visa just in case he ends up wanting to stay indefinitely because that first year switched into skilled worker visa will now start counting towards the five that might be needed for indefinitely to remain. Whereas the time in senior specialist worker in the first two years won't. Um, the next is graduate trainee worker. This is a replacement for the intra-company transfer graduate trainee route. It's not that well known or utilized historically. Uh, it, it is for large scale structured graduate training programs. So a small number of sponsored employers use it. It could be highly valuable to you as recruiters, uh, particularly if you have a need for graduates um, and they're suitable for roles you want to fill. So um, as you would expect, uh, there's a higher skill level for this one as well compared to the skilled worker visa and um, that separate category of a graduate skilled role. The individual will be starting on their pathway towards career in that graduate skilled role. Um, the salary level is lower, recognizing that they're, if they've just graduated and they'll be going through a trainee graduate structured program. So minimum is 23,100, that's a visa minimum and that's the absolute minimum. It can't be reduced pro rata. Or whichever is the higher of that or 70% of the going rate for the role. It's been it's reduced by 70 percent effectively because this is a new entrant to the labor market. Uh, individuals can stay for up to one year and they can move between roles as part of the training program without a need for a new visa, which is very helpful. It's flexible. And there used to be a limit on the number of trainees that you as a sponsor could bring in each year on this scheme. And that's been removed. So now there's no limit on the number you could bring in. But as an employer, you'll need to demonstrate you have a structured graduate uh, training program the connection between you and entities overseas, the employment relationship uh, and, and the employee having employment status with the, the entity overseas, etc. So an example then, a multinational online retailer, I'm sure you can all think of one um, off the top of your head, has a structured graduate training program that enables placements around the world for newly recruited graduates. Now, as, as it stands and without a sponsor license, they're unlikely to have individuals who are graduates and in the training program outside the UK that could just come to the UK to work. Because post Brexit, uh, generally speaking, unless you're a British or Irish national, we have rights linked to Commonwealth um, and ancestry, et cetera, or spouse relationships, you're not gonna have a right automatically to work in the UK. So the UK branch gets a graduate trainee route license under Global Business Mobility, applies for that online to the Home Office, and then successful applicants with three months service abroad, you do have to have that minimum period of service, can be sponsored to uh, do work placements in senior or specialist positions in the UK for up to one year. One trainee in 2022 performs particularly well. And so, again, giving you an idea of the, the recruitment life cycle, the UK sponsor uh, branch moves them across to a five year skilled worker visa, because you can apply for five years up front of a visa and that gives them a five-year period at the end of which if they've got qualifying residents in the UK they'll be able to settle so again it can be a pathway towards 
um, settlement in the UK, but certainly moving from a short term graduate training program to a longer term permanent role, which is very helpful. Um, there was a question on the uh, chat around kind of use for interns with a one year placement who've not yet graduated for a gap year in industry, for example. Um, obviously, there's a new new set of rules, but I think I think the answer will be no, because they will have had to have three months employment, proper employment with you abroad. That would be the thing we'd have to look at to see whether that can be used in this context. Um, the, the, the overall context of this is it's a graduate, i.e. you are a graduate, you've started in a role and you're on a structured training programme where you can move. So I think I think gap year whilst you're still in your studies is not going to be captured. Um, service suppliers, uh, yeah, do put your questions in the Q&A function, um, please, that would be great. Service suppliers. Now, we've seen a lot of activity around this post-Brexit now that borders are opening up um, as the, the restrictions around the pandemic have eased around this issue of businesses who operate outside of the UK, for example, European engineering companies, um, installers of things like furniture, uh, even um, you know, high level context, uh, complex IT service providers who are have, con have commercial relationships with a UK client and they need to come in and do certain things to deliver on that contract. That can be important for both the service supplier, who we end up often doing a lot of work with, but also for the UK customer who may be struggling to find local providers who have the skilled workers that can actually deliver on these sorts of contracts, whether it's building a new plant of some for something, um, you know, commercial plant and location or the other examples I gave. So we now have this service suppliers route and it replaces this T5 international agreement, which was one of the short term uh, temporary work routes under the points based system. Now, the requirements are essentially the same, but there's a and that includes having a UK sponsor of visas. So slightly unusual this, you'd have the, the UK customer gets a sponsor license in order to sponsor the visa for the worker of the supplier, say engineering company abroad. Still, the worker is employed and engaged by the engineering company in, say, France, but um, their visa to come over and work on the contract is sponsored by the UK client. So it's not been that commonly used. It requires a really good cooperative relationship between the UK client and the entity abroad because the UK client has to get to sponsor licensing, which is, you know, takes time and effort. But if it's used, the worker gets 12 months, uh, worker with 12 months service rather, um, with the non-UK business supplier can be sent to the UK if they're delivering on a contract covered by one of the UK trade agreements. An obvious one to look at is the Brexit Trade and Cooperation Agreement, but there are others. There's no minimum salary for this role. Obviously, national minimum wage, you would always expect and has to be honoured for any hours worked in, in the UK, that should be covered. But there's no minimum salary thresholds for the visa. And around skill level, well, it's expected to be graduate skilled roles, which is obviously unhelpful for some service suppliers. But there is an alternative. There's options A and B, A being you show it's graduate level role, or you can demonstrate there's an appropriate or equivalent technical qualification and skills and experience required for the role that the workers hold. They also have to be the, a national of the country from which um, the service supplier is based and, and they're being sent from. So let's look at a quick example. A uh, Dutch architectural firm's got a contract to design a big new campus for a UK insurance broker. They don't have a UK presence, so they don't have the ability to employ people locally um, to, to do this work. The insurance broker decides, I'm happy to sponsor the visas because we want you to do this work and you're the right provider for the job. It adds, because it already has an existing skilled worker license, the service supplier route for free. It doesn't have to pay for that. And then it sponsors through certificates of sponsorships the move of workers from the Dutch architectural firm to come and work on the contract for a short period of a few months. It can only do that though, because the contract and the services they've checked uh, is covered by the EU UK trade and cooperation agreement. And the chief designer is a Dutch national, the person they want to move across. So it's national as a country of, of, of seat of the architectural firm. And so it can be sponsored, she can be sponsored to come and do the client side work to deliver the project. So it's important to keep that in mind if you might even be the client or maybe some of you are not UK based and you're delivering services into the UK, you're going to possibly need to look at that. Um, secondment worker then, this is an entirely new route under the points based system, new concepts to get used to. And it's for UK and non-UK businesses 
who are in a, in a commercial relationship have a contract worth at least 50 million pounds. So we're talking large value contracts, it's different ways in which you have to demonstrate that. If you can show you've got UK, non-UK business, 50 million pounds minimum value contract, workers with 12 months service at the non-UK entity can come to the UK for one, maybe extend to two years. They can extend to two years if they wish. There's no minimum salary requirement and it's a graduate skilled role. So you can see there's some, some similarities to the service supplier route here, but this is more about closer, longer term relationships between UK and non-UK business and that high value contract. So here's an example. French energy company has a contract with a UK engineering company to build a nuclear power plant. The company needs to send eight of its long standing workers to the UK for one year to collaborate on the project. Now the contract value is 200 million. And so it's eligible for the common worker route and uh, the individuals come over and as is not uncommon, I'm sure you will know people watching who are involved in recruitment and HR. Um, Scommon is happening and the UK company subsequently gets quite interested in keeping three of the workers for itself and agrees because they're still getting on, which is obviously nice um, with the uh, non UK company in France that it will sponsor them and, and take them on as employees through a change of employment application from within the UK. They can they don't have to leave the UK and come back to switch into skilled worker visas. So they've changed employer through this process and three of them will end up on permanent roles with a long term route to settlement in the UK for the UK engineering company that's collaborating on the project. So there's the timeline through. So that is a canter through the global business mobility routes, which, as we've said, will always involve connection between a UK based entity and an entity overseas for um, non routes to settlement visas um, where there's no English language requirement and some quite creative options there to be used. Quick poll for everybody before I hand over to Bumit who's going to look at the other routes that have come through, is which of these routes do you think is the most useful or beneficial to you? It's multiple choice. You can choose more than one, um, but it'd be, give us a sense of where you think your uh, organization, the most value might be uh, derived. So allow a little bit of time for those to be completed. While we're doing that, I'll just remind everybody to do, do, do pop questions into the question and answer uh, function if you have any of those. We should be getting the results of the poll shortly. Okay, so uh, that's, it, it, that's interesting. It's probably not entirely surprising that we have the standout highest response is for senior specialist worker, which is the one that's most has been most commonly used under the traditional ITT. Expansion worker quite low because of course that's no UK presence. Graduate trainee worker is at 32%, which is good and encouraging because it could be a really useful tool. Um, service supplies at 14 and comment at 21. So actually quite good level of response. We've got quite a few people on the, the session today who might be looking and exploring those. So that's great. Thank you for that feedback. Um, I'm going to hand over to Bermit now, who's going to talk about some of these other really interesting routes that don't have to involve connections between a UK entity and an entity overseas. Over to you, Bermit. Thank you, Adam. Good morning. Um, yes, uh, I'm going to talk you through um, some of the other routes. Um, I think, firstly, beginning with the startup and innovator. So these two routes um, have carried over from the old immigration rules. So they, they um, haven't, haven't been replaced. Um, and there were typically those um, graduates with entrepreneurial flair that have been endorsed to come in and start up a new business um, or to build on an existing business here in the UK. Um, the benefit to you as HR and recruitment processes is that these individuals um, in the startup category they have an eligibility to work um, alongside setting up their business. Um, that route doesn't require sponsorship on your part. So there you've got the possibility to tap into young graduate talent, those that have uh, entrepreneurial flair, ideas, um, and are building their own business, but also could add something um, to your business without the requirement for you to sponsor them. 
So um, that is something to bear in mind. And I think the important thing to highlight here is that um, there are so many different visa route types under the old rules and the new rules over the transitional period. And it's important that you look to the right to work checks just to ensure that the individual that you are looking at does have that right to work for you without sponsorship. Um, and obviously we can help you um, with that and to differentiate who can and who can't work uh, under the route that they're already on. <clears throat> so, and these two routes, they're both also open to switching. So if you do come across a talent um, with an individual who's already here on this kind of visa, but you'd like to bring them into the company and you have a sponsor license, then obviously you can move them and switch them into the skilled worker category. Now, this next um, new visa route, the scale up, this is a very exciting, very interesting route um, that is not going to require sponsorship. So this is definitely something that you may consider that your company may be eligible from, and the route is going to be open from August 2022. So for this route, um, it's looking at eligible companies already existing in the UK. So, you know, any of your countries, any of your companies, there's approximately 34,000 UK companies that the, the Home Office have considered would be eligible for this route. So the eligibility requirements is that you have to show three years of annual average revenue or empl employment growth of 20%. Um, and at the beginning of that three year period, so whenever you um, decide to apply, you must have had at least 10 employees. How this scale up route requires, it works, is that you simply just put out a job offer to the individual that you'd like to hire. Um, and they would then make an application for a scale-up visa. So the difference between the scale-up and the skilled worker um, is the fact that there is a higher salary for the scale-up. Um, obviously, they're looking at uh, the individual to be of, of a high caliber graduate level and to be quite specialist um, in the area that they're working in. So the difference there is a skilled worker is uh, starts at around 26,500, whereas the scale-up is looking to 33,000. Now, what's the benefit of the scale up versus the skilled worker? Um, the sponsorship setup requirements are costly and can take up to 12 weeks. Uh, so the scale up route is uh, quite, <clears throat> it, it looks good, sounds good because um, you, you're not gonna have that 12 weeks. And also they're saying that decisions are going to be fast track. So within 72 hours, they are hoping that decisions can be made within 72 hours. Therefore, you could make your job offer and within a week, you could have the individual here um, because they're looking at these scale ups are for those that companies that growth is happening rapidly. Um, and they want to make sure that those companies experience rapid growth can hire the best talent very quickly. Seasonal workers and frontier workers, um, you may already be familiar with the seasonal worker. Um, and some of your companies may be eligible um, for having seasonal workers. It, it is a small um, niche group of people, for example, fruit picking, flower picking, um, and it's usually seasonal work as it suggests. Um, and that's continuing on from the previous immigration rules. The, as, you, as you may be familiar, there was the heavy goods vehicles drivers that had been brought in on an emergency basis to come under the seasonal worker. Um, they've now removed that requirement. Um, and so they, they do no, no longer qualify. In terms of frontier workers, um, it's probably best to give you an example of this. So, Bella, a French national, travels to the UK every year in the summer to work in a hotel in the Peak District. She stays during the busy summer months and then returns back to France. Um, so she's resident in France. She doesn't live in the UK. She's usually here for six months at a time. She doesn't require sponsorship if she has already applied for a frontier worker visa. These frontier worker visas came along at the same time as a requirement to sign up for EU settled status or pre-EU settled status. So with this visa, she can change her employment without any limits, um, as long as the work is genuine and effective. So for example, if you have EU nationals, uh, say you're in the hotel industry, 
and you you know of chambermaids or individuals that are working at another hotel they have this frontier worker status you can employ them without requiring any sponsorship um, because they already have a frontier worker visa and they can switch um, like i said the only main requirement is that they're here for a maximum of six months and usually for example in the hotel industry it's usually during the peak time that you need that extra staff and you don't need them all year round. So a frontier worker is a good um, option um, where you do have, um, like in the hospitality sector, where you have certain times of year where you're busier more than others. So the student route. Um, the student route, there's new routes that have opened up within this, um, but the traditional tier four remains the same. So a typical scenario, um, Oliver, a final year computer science student, applies for your advertised post um, as a junior web developer to help with updating and maintaining your website. He has the right background and he's been learning the web development as part of his course. So he, and he's enthusiastic, lots of strong ideas. Um, you do not need to sponsor him because he's already sponsored by his university. Um, he can work for you on a part-time basis for up to 20 hours a week during term time. Um, and then on a full time basis <clears throat> during the holidays. So under this route, again, you don't require sponsorship. You just need to do the right to work check. Um, make sure that you have the student's timetable so that you can evidence that he's doing the right number of hours outside of term time and during term time. Um, and once he graduates, um, he's now got an option. He can go into a graduate visa or be sponsored as a skilled worker by you if you have a sponsor license. So then you're looking to consider, OK, should the individual go to the graduate route or should we sponsor him? So once Oliver receives the confirmation that he successfully completed the course, there's no requirement to wait for the graduation ceremony. He can apply to switch to a graduate visa. Um, the graduate visa is for a period of two years and he can continue to work for you um, as a web developer or in any other role in the business that's appropriate to him. Um, and he can move into full time employment. Again, you don't need to sponsor him. Um, he will have to make an application and the application fee is around £700. Um, and then there is the immigration health surcharge. Compared to setting up a sponsor license and then sponsoring him, paying the immigration skills charge, um, paying the application fees. This is a much cheaper alternative um, for an individual um, who is a student who moves into the graduate. So if you've got an individual and they want to discuss with you and they come to you and say, well, you know, I've done my degree, would you, would you consider employing me? Um, it may be a discussion at that point as to um, the different options that you have. Um, because, Actually, there is no benefit to that skilled worker. Um, in the past, the benefit of the skilled worker is that you'd tie that individual in because they wouldn't be able to move to another employer um, unless the other employer had carried out a resident labour market test, advertised the post, and they couldn't. They they had to prove they couldn't find anybody else. Whereas things have changed, um, and now uh, individuals can move from one to the other quite quickly. So really, there there isn't any added advantage of almost tying in an individual to a skilled worker visa. Um, moving on, uh, this is another new route. Um, student kind of related. This is the high potential individual. Um, and again, another new route that doesn't require sponsorship. So in this scenario, Beth is an overseas graduate. She graduated in the last five years and has studied at a university which appears on the Home Office Global Universities list. So she's eligible to come to the UK without sponsorship and in fact, without a job offer. So she could be in the UK and then she can look for the type of employment that she wants to take. Um, and she can be here for a period of two years. So these are individuals that may be uh, highly sought after um, by employers and HR individuals because um, these individuals are the elite. They have come from the top 50 universities from around the world. Um, and so much so that we just want to acquire that talent here in the UK um, that they don't even need a job offer. They can come in and the Home Office are uh, pretty confident that these individuals um, will look at the best roles most suited to them um, with their skills. 
So a point to consider here is, does your company want to look to an international milk round? So the global universities list will update yearly. Um, there's 50 universities on there, mostly US universities at the moment. We have um, one from Hong Kong. I think there's a German university there. But is it a consideration that you know that the talent that you're looking for and actually you could go across to those universities, you can meet people and actually you can make them aware of the fact that there, are, there is this route that could bring them into the UK and they could come in and work for you. So the difference between this visa um, and say the, the graduate route visa, um, the difference is that this caters for the overseas graduates, whereas um, the other one is really for your homegrown UK students. Um, and the difference again here is that they could have graduated in the last five years. As long as at the time that they graduated, their university was on this global universities list, um, then they will be eligible to come into the UK. So again, as I said, that right to work check is important. Um, there may be times that you want to seek guidance from us to say, actually, this individual's come with this visa type. Are they going to be eligible to work? Do we need to sponsor them? Um, and this last slide is really just to give you an overview, um, particularly with, with students. Um, they are normally on a journey. Um, once they've been here, they're looking to become settled and, and live here and to remain here. So this is, just gives you an indication of um, the life cycle. So with a student, typically maybe doing a three year degree, they're going to be on a student visa. They won't need sponsorship from you. They can work with you. They move on to the graduate visa for two years. Again, no sponsorship required by your company. And they've then been here five years. You then sponsor them as a skilled worker. Once you've seen that they're, they're doing a good job for you and you, they're the right fit for your company. And after five years, they can then move into a settled worker and get indefinite leave to remain. At this point, you no longer need to sponsor them. Um, they have the right to work here. There's no additional costs for you anymore. So that's the longer term route. Um, with the high potential individual equally, they can come in for between two and three years. If they have a PhD qualification, they can actually come in for three years. Um, they could then move into your skilled worker route if you're still happy that, that you know, they're doing the right job for you. Uh, again, they then work, move into the settled worker route. So there's a lot of potential um, for all of various routes um, to work for you as recruitment without the need for sponsorship. Um, equally, as Adam has said, there is so many uh, routes that do require sponsorship. So there's a whole array um, of options for you. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to the poll. So which of the following will be your immediate focus for recruitment? Yeah, so on that list, we've got a uh, single choice, this one, so it has to be the most important. So becoming a sponsor of migrant workers, we've got using your existing license to transfer workers from abroad. We've got checking your systems and processes are compliant for sponsor license duties so that you don't risk losing the license. Uh, recruiting or sponsoring students for long term work and then recruiting students for short term work, uh, moving workers to set up uh, new UK ops or UK terms of employment for migrant workers. And that would include things like, well, what terms are we meant to have about our, our rights to report certain changes to the Home Office about them or their obligations to us in terms of changes that they need to tell us about. So there's a lot to choose from. And results come in. That's quite a mix there for me, isn't there? Mm -hmm. um, the, the two that are standing out as the two highest at 27 and 31 percent of answers, so collectively they're making up nearly six, 60 percent, are using your existing license to transfer workers from abroad. So that may be involving global business mobility as an alternative to skilled worker um, and checking systems and processes that are compliant. I think that's that's good to see because obviously that's really important having the license and knowing and being able to utilize strategically the, the routes to really maximize your value from recruitment is great, but that's the start of the process in terms of visa sponsorship. It's an ongoing relationship with the Home Office. So uh, yeah, we still had some quite big numbers, nearly 10% talking about becoming a sponsor, 15% we're talking about students, which may not require sponsorship at all, certainly in the initial period, um, and short-term work for students as well. So that's really good. It looks like it, the session is helping us to just reflect on and think about the mix that we can use um, in terms of our recruitment to try, try and make sure we're not disadvantaged in the current pressures. 
in the labour market. Uh, we had a couple of questions um, at the end. I think we can, we've got a bit of time to squeeze in, so keep those coming in if, if you have them. Um, the first one be, for me was for the scale-up visa, and the question was around um, COVID issues and when an employer is looking to have their authorization as a scale-up employer so that the individual could make a sponsored or unsponsored scale-up application, are they going to come into consideration when looking at the growth of 20%? Um, um, unfortunately, I mean, we've had limited guidance um, on the scale-up and actually there is more guidance due to come out. Um, so, I mean, there could be um, a COVID concession um, because there has been for other routes. So some of you may be aware on an individual basis with a spouse and the financial requirement during COVID, there was the fact that there was a period where there was a concession. But to be fair, on all of the routes that did have a COVID concession, those have now stopped. So yeah. if we were reflecting, if I was to, if I was to kind of take a, a, an educated guess, I would probably think not, just because the other concessions have now come to come to a stop. Yeah, I think that's right. I, there's nothing that, that we're aware of in the existing guidance and I don't, with, in the current climate, I don't perceive there's much likelihood of a new, um, of a new uh, concession being introduced for it. So I think, I, th I suspect they're gonna stick fairly rigidly to those key hallmarks of the 20% growth. Mm -hmm. um, so yes. Uh, another question, I think just a clarification one was around the high potential uh, visa. Does the person have to have graduated from a non-UK university in order to benefit uh, from that? The or high can, potential. Can they, yeah, can they, can they have graduated from a listed university in the UK? Um, to be fair, the list at the moment is, um, having had a look at the list, there is no UK universities on that list. So mm. I think this route is aimed at the international students um, oh. because we've got other options, like, like you said, the graduate visa route, et cetera, for our own home, those that come to the UK to study. So I yeah. think it is just going to be for those who study outside of the UK. Yes, yeah. Um, we had a question around uh, seasonal worker visas, which I've had a little look at while you were um, talking through those other examples there. Uh, do you have to have a, a government approved, do you have to be in a government approved operator? Well, the answer really lies in the supporting documents requirements, uh, Appendix A, for when you're applying for a license, which talks about if you want to be a seasonal worker, you need to send your, in, your endorsement from DEFRA, because at the moment, of course, it's around um, food and agriculture and of course by the, when you're going to do that that will have required you necessarily to have gone through some information process and sharing with DEFRA um, their request for information exercise to have that recognition so it's not formally that you need to be going via a government approved op operator but you will as the scheme expands and other routes uh, open be like the DEFRA situation we it's, it's likely you will need to have some recognition and formal approval from a relevant sector regulator or, or overarching governing body I think um, is the answer to that one um, another question on the uh, scale-up visa if it starts in August how soon can we look to make an application uh, can we do it in advance with a view to start date for the employee being in after August. Well, yes. yes. Yeah, go on, go on. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Um, I mean, uh, it would be, now is a good time. So this is, a, this is quite an, an exciting route. And I think actually now is a good time for you to get in touch with us. Um, we'd offer you a consultation and look at whether your company actually may meet the eligibility requirements for that scale up. And yes, we can do that preparation um, and make those applications so that individuals can come in when that route opens up in August. So certainly if you're interested, uh, you know, after this uh, uh, webinar, um, please make your interest known to us and we can set up the appropriate meetings. I think yeah. there was another question about the scale up in terms of can you there bring is, monthly yeah. members? Um, yes. Yeah, and I think the answer to that is yes, you can. Um, yeah. So a lot of these routes, yes, you can bring your dependents. Um, so again, another uh, reason why that scale up is really looking like um, a good visa route. Yeah, I think that, that and that's partner and dependent children, isn't it? And mm -hmm. the thing to think about, and one of the things that we end up as a team doing 
<clears throat> once you dig deeper into this, and we, we're obviously keeping a helicopter view on today's session, is the cost benefit analysis. Now, depending on whether the employer is going to cover some of the costs associated with the individual's actual, actual visa application, that can be quite important because you've got an immigration health surcharge, it's over £600 for each year of the visa for the lead applicant, and that's payable up front. There's a few hundred pounds then again for each of the dependents. So it is a route, and several others will allow dependents, but some of the strategic planning has to be okay, well, how much does that cost? Who's going to bear that cost? If we're going to cover it, are we going to have clawback provisions? Because there's always a risk that someone will join us in the UK and then we'll, um, we'll leave. Particularly now post 2020, when we've got that greater ability, as Bameet mentioned earlier, to change employer and sponsor. It's not quite the same value of employment that's dedicated to the sponsor as it was. It's still pretty sticky, if I can put it that way. Is much, it clearly is harder to change jobs if you're a sponsored visa holder than if you're not, and you, you're just freely moving in the domestic labour market. But it is possible, much easier than it was, because there's not 28 days of advertising that must have been done by an approved sponsor before they could even offer the role to change. So with that sort of risk, the flight risk, you're looking as an employer, aren't you, and saying, well, the, the, the route works, but what are the costs? Who's going to pay what? Are we going to require that sums paid back? If so, for how much has to be paid back for how long, because you've got penalty clause issues from an employment law perspective. So it's really about, when you dig deeper, talking about things like, okay, if this route works, what type of roles does it work for? Are there types of roles that it's not viable to sponsor, even if they are just, a, just about eligible? Because we need to be able to articulate why, things like discrimination risk, you know, well, why have you sponsored that person for a skilled, I know that person's got a scale up visa, and you're sponsoring them, but you're rejecting me. That's quite tricky to answer unless you're able to articulate, look, as a, as a policy, as an employer, our cost benefit analysis and our the value of the roles have all been assessed and roles in this level that you're applying for sit below what we can sponsor. Got to have that consistent methodology. So that's a lot of the work that comes next in saying we want to pull on all these routes and use them to maximise value. But we also need to think about the detail of when do we use them, are we only going to pay for the individual's costs in certain scenarios for certain value roles? Are we only going to use this route for certain value roles and scenarios? How do we articulate that? Um, so that, But that is something that will pay dividends, I think, for most employers going forward. If you've set that up right, you're going to be right at the front of the pack in terms of your ability to look like an employer of choice because you can offer these opportunities to a, the widest array of applicants as possible and also give yourself maybe a competitive edge as a result in the, in the, in the labour market. So um, there's lots of that detail underneath around things like dependence. So um, good, we've had lots of questions. As Bermit said, um, we are able to offer initial consultations, um, Zoom consultations if people want to uh, start talking about their journey towards maximising or even starting to use some of these routes or sponsorship. So we'll set out details of of, of when those slots would be available and how you can ask to have one of those um, conversations if you're watching live, of course, um, and not watching this on a, on a recording at a later date. Um, and that, that will be great if people want to look at it further. Thanks everybody for attending the session today. And uh, Bameet and I look forward to seeing you at another session uh, soon. Thanks very much. Thank you.